<sighs> Hi, I'm Derek Burrows. And no, this is not a test. But it is all about testing. You know how they say you're never more than three feet away from a spider? Creepy. But instead, think about this. You're never more than three feet away from something that's been tested. Come with me as I start my day, and I'll show you what I mean. That phone that woke me up, that's the product of thousands of hours of testing. My light switch, check this out. (laughs) Gift from my grandma, that was tested. Your appliances, gadgets, vehicles, devices, things you wear, all are tested. This coffee maker was tested. We'd better get going, I am late. Press the down button, would you? In our first episode, that's this one, I'm going to show you why testing is so important, so overlooked, so underrated. Not long ago, I asked my colleague Brad about his elevator pitch for testing. You know, you're on an elevator, you have just a few seconds, what do you say to convince someone that testing is important? Brad didn't blink. He said, I would tell them, imagine this elevator had never been tested. You know what? Let's take the stairs. Uh, Testing. One, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Why testing matters. This is a test. An original podcast from NI. This is only a test. Three, two, one, zero. Look around you, and you'll see the fruit of tens of thousands of testing successes, and thousands of failures that led to them. Buildings, tools, roads, bridges, hardware, and software. For an engineer's perspective on the importance of testing, I put in a call to Melanie Craig Nolan. With some 17 years' experience, her background is in structural engineering, she has her bachelor's in architectural engineering, her master's in engineering management, and just finished her doctoral coursework. And she's worked as a bridge engineer in Manhattan and has had her own business for about 10 years, specializing in disaster recovery. And here she comes now to pick me up in her Maserati. Which has most definitely been tested. So thank you so much, Melanie, for this very convenient ride to the airport in the nicest car I've ever been in. (laughs) You're welcome. It's a pleasure. I wanted Melanie to give her engineer's perspective on some of history's cautionary tales, some never again lessons that shaped today's testing industry. The sinking of the Titanic, the Hindenburg disaster. But first, I wanted to ask her about the collapse of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge dawn of a fatal day, and the wind begins to speak with a roar that no man can fail to hear. You know that old 1950s film of the bridge oscillating back and forth in the wind before crumbling and falling into the water? That's the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It opened on July 1st, 1940, and from the beginning would heave and sway in the wind. No structure of steel and concrete can stand such a strain. Steel girders buckle and giant cables snap like puny threads. There it goes! On November 7th that year, with heavy winds, it oscillated wildly for more than an hour before ultimately collapsing. Engineers are divided as to the cause of the disaster. Some claim it was the use of solid girders. Others differ. But whatever for Melanie, happens, there's no mystery to the problems with that bridge. The issue is this country, the United States, did not have wind provisions, okay, code to design for wind loads until this 1970s. Wow. And I say that because any structure built prior to the 1970s was kind of an experiment. It's terrible. It sounds terrible. But I mean, that is how we advance. We try things. We fail. One of my favorite uh, saying is to fail and fail often. And unfortunately, some of these failures result in catastrophic loss of life. And as engineers, that is, that is our worst nightmare. With the Tacoma Narrows, that bridge was literally called Galloping Gertie from from its opening. 
The engineer knew that they needed a larger structure. The engineer knew that the oscillations were a concern, but the engineer was being, I'll say bullied for lack of a better word. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, engineers are bullied into doing something by politicians, by stress, by a client, by a deadline, by a schedule. And the engineer knew, and, and years later, they would ask him questions and he said, I knew that structure was undersized. That bridge was built and it was a unique structure because they had built bridges before. They just decided to go with a new design, something that had not been analyzed. And that was the result. The wow. result was a complete and total catastrophic failure of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. One of the biggest tragic elements uh, of the many tragedies, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, I read that they commissioned a study because the oscillations began even during construction. And so they reached out to the University of Washington to do wind tunnel tests, something that probably would have been very useful before they actually ended up building this bridge. And they built a few different models at different scales and found a proposal, a solution that could have prevented this oscillation. By the time that research was done, that research was submitted five days before the bridge fell down. So the solution never got to be enacted. But it's one of those things where you react as opposed to predicting that something might happen and, uh, you know, tragedy strikes. In my entire career, I have been a, a big supporter of preparedness and not reacting to a situation. Because when we react, we are already behind the eight ball. If we knew it was coming, then we should have been proactive about it proactive about the solution. And we constantly see this. It continues to plague us. It continues to plague our industry. We keep reacting to a situation such as a pandemic. We knew one could happen. We reacted. We were not proactive. We do this with earthquakes. We do this with tsunamis. We know these things exist and yet we allow it to happen to us. And then we react, which we need to change that entire paradigm of thinking. Looking down our field ahead of them, getting a glimpse of the mooring mass. And that's when I asked Melanie to rewind three years to Lakehurst, New Jersey in May 1937. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It's burst into flames. Get this started, get this started. It's flying and it's crashing. It's crashing terrible. Oh my, get out of the way, please. The German commercial passenger-carrying rigid airship, in the pride of Nazi Germany, the Hindenburg, exploded, killing 36 of the 97 people aboard. The cause of the ignition is still under debate, and the words of radio announcer Herb Morrison still resonate more than eight decades later. And the frame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass of the humanity and all the passengers. The Germans opted not to use helium in the Hindenburg, a main reason being that the United States held most of the world's supply. They opted for hydrogen, which was cheaper and tragically highly flammable. As Melanie explains, the events of that day should not have come as a surprise to anyone. It's frightening that something like this, they knew this thing could explode. They knew that it was very delicate in uh, tough weather conditions. They had lost uh, airships before to explosions. And somehow this was just swept under the rug and it was uh, celebrated as, oh, look at this marvel, this airship docking. And they knew that the safety wasn't there. They knew that it could result in a catastrophe and nothing was done until it was photographed and filmed by dozens, if not uh, hundreds of people, which ended uh, the airship industry can tell you that they did a, a flame test. They wanted to see what the spread of the flame was on the material. They could have used material that was less flammable as humanly possible. I don't know if at the time they even had access to, to that sort of information. You know, it was one big balloon, right? They could have had multiple balloons within that. So if one failed, the rest could carry on and you could have a safety landing. We call that redundancy in engineering. If you have one major system and it fails, if it fails, do you have a backup? That's redundancy, and that had zero redundancy. Also, this the safety, if, if something went wrong, they knew that this thing could explode, it could crash, it could get wayward during a weather event. Then I asked her about the mother of all engineering fails, the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. Well, the Titanic is an epic fail. 
and it is an epic fail on many levels, okay? It was an epic fail to build a ship that wasn't a double hull, which was the industry standard. They wanted to save money. They wanted it to be lightweight. That was mistake probably number one. Mistake number two is I believe it had 16 chambers and the engineer knew if four of them flood, it's going to sink. He knew that fact. That is lacking factors of safety and redundancy across the board. When it took sail, when it launched, there was a coal fire in its belly. And that was never told to anyone on the ship that there was an active fire in one of the, the coal bays. The, the captain of the ship was warned that there was adverse weather and adverse sailing conditions, that there were icebergs. He was warned multiple times. He did change course. He didn't stop. He didn't slow down. He could have, but he went full steam ahead. Then there's the unbelievable failure of the lifeboats having half of the capacity for the passengers, the way that the evacuation took place, uh, which was a mess. Uh, the fact that they, they abandoned people and decided to go back to try to rescue them. I mean, it was just one bad decision after the next that led to that ship sinking. What additional testing do you think could have been done on the Titanic to prevent it's hard to say because obviously driving head on or rather skidding head on into an iceberg is a, a difficult thing to imagine surviving unscathed. But what kind of testing do you think the engineers of the Titanic could have done to save more lives or save the ship? What's interesting is you can approach testing from a, a variety of angles. I could go and talk about the rivets and the type of steel and the number you know, of air chambers and, and all this jazz, but when it comes down to it, where was the safety evacuation? Where were the tests to evacuate? You know, If there's 4,000 people on this ship, how do we go about evacuating them and, and getting them onto lifeboats and life vests and, and calling for help? They should have prepared for the worst, a, a ship sinking with thousands of people. We've talked about three different tragedies today, three different engineering failures, and it sounds like there's some recurring themes between all of them. Melanie, could you explore that a little bit more? What do you think is the consistent part of why these big disasters happened? All being very unique. I mean, it's an airship, a bridge, and a, and a vessel, a shipping vessel. I think about where were the models Engineers have different laboratories where they can model wind and wave, and I'm sure they, don't, they did not have those tools at that time. I just think that today we would have had a scale model, we would have done an analysis, we would have had computers. Back then, they made decisions to save some money and to save some time, and they didn't test any of their safety precautions, not that I'm aware anyway. I don't even know that safety was even a, a major consideration at that time. But they knew the steel of the ship, that they had wanted to save some money on that, and they probably should not have, uh, which ended up tearing a hole being torn through it because of an iceberg. That's something that should have been considered. Is the steel strong enough to with, withstand an impact like that? And the answer was no. With the Hindenburg, you know, are we using flame retardant materials? They knew this thing could explode. Where's the redundancy? Why didn't we have multiple balloons within the major balloon so that if one failed, we had backup, we could land the thing safely at least? And with the Tacoma Narrows, I believe they did have a, a scale model of that. And, and the engineer was aware that this thing was going to have excessive movement. Testing of materials with bridge engineering, you know, we have a standard. We use, we use certain types of steel, but we have developed an industry standard at this point. At that time, I don't believe those things existed, but there was a paradigm. They, they knew that they had a bridge structure that would work. They just wanted to design something new. And how do you test something that is brand new? At the time, I think the tools were limited. Would testing have, uh, have uh, prevented these catastrophes? I absolutely believe so, but I just don't think we had the tools at that time. We do have the tools today. Melanie, thank you so much for talking with me today. It's been fun talking through some of the massive disasters that have happened to various craft in the world, as I am about to put myself in a pressurized box in the sky. So fingers crossed nothing bad happens there. And thank you again so much for chatting with me. Thank you and have a safe flight. Three lineups, a security check, and a bag of Doritos later, I am sitting in a Boeing A320 next to a person every nervous passenger should have the honor to fly with. 
Chris Solon is a chief offering manager in aerospace defense and government business with NI. But get a load of this CV. My background, I joined NI in January of early this year, right before the pandemic. I, I went to college as an engineer, but then I went into the Air Force and decided to to fly jets. I thought that would be cool. Then I that kind of led me into being a uh, an airline pilot for a while. And I decided to use my engineering background and went to a startup company building jets, very light jet aircraft, learned a lot about kind of the flight tests and data world and transitioned progressively into the data analytics and, you know, support of of engineering and tests in in that way and made my way to, to NI. I'm not a nervous flyer. I just haven't completely grasped the idea that it's natural for human beings to fly inside a 10-ton pressurized tube at 500 miles an hour, five miles above terra firma. I had questions. Oh, I had questions. About turbulence, for one. When I watch the wings during a bumpy patch, I see them flex. I asked about testing for wing stress and why it sometimes seems like these wings flap like a bird flying through the sky. That bending motion that you see is very much part of the design. As you know, any structure, metal or composite structure that you had, if you bend it to a certain point, it springs right back. As long as that doesn't exceed a certain deformation, that part has not lost any of its integrity. And in fact, that bending motion allows it to absorb energy and not build up stress and start to fracture and things like that. So that's totally part of the design. To start with the whole turbulence thing, you know, think of it like a leaf that falls off of a tree in a windy day. And that leaf swirls around and it's flying all over the place and it looks pretty violent, you know. If you were sitting on that leaf, you'd be probably struggling to keep your lunch down. I'll be honest, this isn't really helping me so far, Chris. No, but think about that leaf eventually like gently floats down to the ground and it hasn't crumpled into a little ball because of this. And an aircraft going through varying air masses and things like that, yeah, there's a lot of motion and acceleration and things going on, but generally it's kind of just moving within that air mass. And you know, you as a human with your sensors in your brain, it seems very violent to you, but to the structure, the majority of the time it's not that bad. But one of the basic tests is just generally putting the aircraft into like a giant hydraulic press and pushing up on the wings and seeing over time the stress and strain on the structural members and ultimately getting it to where it breaks. So they'll have a design article that they'll they'll bring to the kind of ultimate yield stress. And the testament to the, the little story of the aircraft company that I worked with, with our our new innovative design of our of our wing, we actually broke the tester before it reached <laughs> that point. So that was quite a quite an accomplishment. Okay, so wing movement during flight not a problem. I next asked Chris about the danger of lightning strikes, which can potentially knock out radios and computers. Besides being completely terrifying, he told me about the checklists, modes, and simulator training pilots have for those worst case scenarios. So I moved on to a question on every passenger's mind. And I presume that you're testing against every edge case and every user failure you can, because everything I've learned from in-flight presentations tells me that if I take my phone off of airplane mode, I will knock out every cell tower and communication device within a 10-block radius. So I'm presuming that's okay as well, or at least not a disaster. Yeah, that's a... uh definite unknown edge case. Well, not unknown. There's been a lot of testing for that because the airlines would like people to be able to use their phones. They'd like you to be able to connect to a, you know, a relay, like a ground relay system and do your work and do all that kind of stuff. So the easier thing from the regulator's perspective, if the data is not there, then they restrict it. So follow the guidelines that they tell you with your cell phone, but you're probably not going to make the aircraft fall out of the sky if you accidentally left your phone on. That's good to know. You'd be more likely to drain your battery because it goes into roam. roam <laughs> you get to the end of your trip, and you're like, where's all my batteries? Because <laughs> your phone was sitting there roaming at 35,000 feet trying to find a tower. It's almost comforting for me to know that because we had one unknown that hadn't been tested enough. And because of that, every single device in the world now has an airplane icon to make sure that we can turn off communications in the case of airline travel. 
So I guess the testing is as rigorous as you say. Absolutely. Explain the cell phone rule? Check. So I moved on to the next in my meticulously crafted risk questions. To my knowledge, we have not tested against snakes on a plane. I do know that I had an experience with a dachshund on a plane <laughs> that uh, that was kind of funny. We get a call. I was I was up in the cockpit and flying along. We get the call from the, the lead flight attendant that a woman had a small miniature dachshund in her purse and this thing got free and kind of freaked out up at altitude and started running around underneath the seats. So you can imagine people feeling something scrape, you know, their ankles like a little warm, furry thing, you know, running around. (laughs) So people start screaming because they don't know what it is. And the dog gets terrified from all the screaming and starts pooping everywhere (laughs) in the cabin. So now you have a hazardous waste situation. Needless to say, we never tested for that, but we did have procedures to secure the dog and clean up the poop. The dog was fine. It settled down. And I was very happy to be a pilot up in the cockpit. It does make me happy that you said you had procedures for that. I feel like the dachshund protocol could probably be applied to a few snakes if necessary. Now, I know that this is unlikely, but it does feel like at any given point, one of us on this plane would be able to try to break into the captain's door and enter into the cockpit. How have we tested against people breaking into the cockpit like in notable tragedies in the recent past? So believe it or not, it's pretty difficult for someone to break into that cockpit. Post 9-11, the cockpit door, that was a big initiative, and and they they had a program called the Fortress Door Design that involves Kevlar reinforcement, and those doors are heavily fortified now to prevent unwanted entry. I think we've proven today that truly, no matter how ridiculous the questions I can come up with are, you guys have thought of everything. Chris, thank you so much for allaying my fears and sharing your expertise. I feel much more confident now speaking with someone who knows just so much more than I do about how we test and build these aircraft. If you are confident walking onto a plane every day, knowing what you know, then I have no reason not to be. So thanks for that. If we learn just one thing today, it's that the people who are least fearful of flying are those who actually test airplanes and understand what they're designed to withstand. You're welcome. From Melanie Craig Nolan, we discovered the human obstacles that engineers and designers face, underlining the need for careful, innovative, thorough, and perhaps most of all, imaginative testing. Oh, and that a Maserati is one sweet ride, even if it is just a sound effect. I'm Derek Burrows. Testing 123 is an original podcast from NI. To find out more, visit our webpage at ni.com slash perspectives.